So welcome, you guys. This is week three of character design and creation. So right off the bat, I want to ask you guys if there's any questions from week two that have come up or anything maybe from week one that you're still a little confused about. Are you guys starting to see the progression of how the class is kind of flowing together with the planning and then building? And then this week we've got, what do we have this week? Assembly, yep. And what else? Resurfacing and UVing, yep. Good job, guys. All right, so that's what we're working on this week. Um, so tonight I'm going to do the how to get started and what to look for, what not to do, and then you should be good to go. Yes, time management can definitely end up being um, difficult from time to time, especially you know for you guys online. You do have jobs and kids outside of school, so it, it, it's hard. <laughs> so I understand 100%. Um, but if there are no questions from last week, let's go ahead and start talking about week three, right? So first thing on the list, like you guys said, is the assembly of parts. So really the hints and tips are this, is just watch the video lecture, take notes as you go. Um, it's basically a step-by-step -step in there. Um, there's really nothing I can say too much there. Um, if your ear is not attaching, Check for reverse normals. Do you guys remember how to do that from our previous lectures or from another class even? Yes. All right, cool. So check for reverse normals if it's not attaching. Use your border edges. Turn those border edges on to make sure everything's nice and buttoned up and all those verts are merged. But really, there's not much there. It shouldn't take you guys too long. I mean, you guys can see the video is 28 minutes and 55 seconds for that. So it shouldn't take much longer than that, okay? Um, so that's a pretty quick assignment. Now, the one that's going to take a lot more time is your resurfacing project, okay? And the UVing and texturing shouldn't be too bad because you guys should pretty much know how to use the tools. Have you done, you've done some UVing in MCR probably, right? Yes. Okay, so you, you've done some UVing, but we're going to kind of, yeah, they're not bad. So I get the, I always get the, the one I'm gonna, I'm sure someone's gonna say it in chat, but when I'm like, all right, let's talk about UVs, and I'll get them, I hate UVs. <laughs> I'm always like, oh, come on, UVing is so easy now, so easy. Back in the day, you guys would be like, this this is the worst thing ever. Um, but now it's a lot easier, so you guys have like all these really cool tools. Um, uh, UVing, uh, let me tell you guys, when I was going through school, it was so bad in Maya that we actually had to download a third party program called Roadkill. Um, that works how UVs are laid out now inside of Maya. So you guys know how you have, you cut your seams and then unfold the shells. It wouldn't do that before. And when it did, it was kind of a really bad. <laughs> it didn't turn out very good. Um, but roadkill was pretty cool because you could go in, cut the seams on for all of your seams that you wanted to place. And it would just go bam, bam, bam and lay out all the shells. It was so nice. And that's kind of what they, they borrowed. I don't want to say copied because... Oh, how many different ways can you really lay out UVs, right? But they kind of borrowed that and implemented that into Maya, and now we have an amazing way, amazingly quick way to lay out those UVs. So assembly of parts, watch the video. Um, don't run, don't run your edges. Like say your ears here, and you need more edges to attach. Don't run them up and through the face, okay? Because you'll end up with banding and uh, do you guys know what banding is by any chance? Or have you heard of it before? No. Okay. Uh, Jason's got it. It's basically bunched up edges. It's almost like um, if you look at your, your character, and let's say you're looking at their leg, and you're rotating around their leg, you know that's supposed to be a cylindrical shape. But if you have too many edges that are too close together, they almost work like holding edges at that point, and it'll kind of look bunched up. Okay, and it looks like bands are actually running up and down the leg. So if you see banding, maybe on a quiz this week, maybe, um, that is what banding is. All right, so if you run edges through your character's head, a whole bunch of them just to attach that ear, what's going to happen is you're going to end up with all these streaks and edges running through the face. Okay, so don't do that. Follow the video, um, because what Marcus teaches you guys is how to kind of loop that geometry back into the ear by using box junctions. 
Okay. Did you mention the video are okay though? Yeah, um, whatever he tells you to add in the video is fine. Like in the back of the head here, because if we look here, this is a really flat back of the head, right? So we're gonna need these extra edges uh, just to bring that out and arc. Because a general rule with the with the awesome vertices here, we always will need three at least to get an arc, right? Um, yeah, the crow's feet, that's another one too. So he'll talk about that. And whatever he says to add in the video is perfectly fine. But if we go and just, I'll know, you'll, you, and you'll know too if you did it, because you'll see there's tons and tons of edges. Like, oh, I, I smoothed my ear. I can't get it to attach to my low res head. It's like, oh my goodness, look at the side of his face. <laughs> it looks like a barcode. Don't do that. If it looks like a barcode, there's too much geometry. All right, so hands and tips for that. Good to go. All right, resurfacing. All right, so resurfacing, this is kind of where our contours and wire draws. Now we have the sculpts, right? We did all of our sculpts and building, and now we're getting into resurfacing. So we had you guys build last week, so you're kind of understanding from the ground up uh, the radials around the eyes, around the mouth, um, and how we loop our edge flow in the face to get it to deform correctly. So when you guys are resurfacing the faces, because I think you have two heads to do and two torsos, um, when you're doing these, I'm hoping that you guys will look back at what you did in week two and week one and tie that into week three, okay? Because we're building, we're constantly building off of the previous weeks. So what is resurfacing? Here is a nice definition that somebody wrote up who's awesome. <clears throat> oh, that's me. I wrote it. Okay, but <laughs> this is a really um, streamlined, I guess, definition that I could come up with for you guys. Um, another term you might hear is retopo, like a lot of the cool kids are like, yeah, I'm going to retopo my mesh. If you hear somebody saying that, they're just talking about resurfacing or retopologizing. Um, so basically, we're taking that high res mesh or model with poor edge flow, and we're, re we're just kind of rebuilding that with new geometry so that it will deform properly when animated. Okay, so if this is similar to baking. No, baking's more um, textures. I think you're thinking of like um, ambient occlusion, ambient occlusion passes, and those would be baked. Um, yes, textures are more textures and like normal maps or displacement maps. Those can be something that are baked. Um, resurfacing. This is when we're actually building that geometry over our high res or model with bad edge flow and making it just so it can deform properly. So let me show you guys, let's talk about some tools that we can use for resurfacing. Okay, so the first one we have is ZBrush. Okay, so there's a brush inside of ZBrush that's pretty cool. Um, that is the topology brush. And basically what we're seeing here is you will actually take your brush and paint the edges. And what'll happen is when ZBrush sees four corners, it'll create a face. So th this is something that works. Um, some people prefer it, like we talked about before, where we talked about, you know, just because something says ZBrush for resurfacing or Maya for resurfacing, it might be even 3D coat or something else that they prefer using, right? It's just, it's just another tool in the bag that we use. Um, so this is ZBrush. Um, they have the topology brush. That's pretty cool. They also have kind of... Uh, automatic resurfacing um, called Z-Remesher. It sort of works, but you can always tell when it's done because Z-Remesher really likes to pit star junctions in places where it probably shouldn't and really weird box junctions sometimes in places where it shouldn't. Uh, so when we see this, we know, hey, that was a Z-Remeshed object that shouldn't look like that. And it's a good start, um, but remember when you guys were doing the, um, the fixing topology, where you're going in and looking for spirals and cleaning all those up and maybe triangles in weird places. Do you guys remember doing that in week two, right? Or is that week one? What's going on? <laughs> it was in week one, right? Yeah, there we go, week one. So you guys did that in week one. So when we did that, because if ever you have to use the remesher or you feel you want to give it a shot, um, those are common errors that can happen when using automatic resurfacing tools. Okay, so a spiral happens around the eye. I know, I know, a 3D coat was a real famous one for 
you would do the, you can draw the guidelines for around the eye and it's like, oh, okay, that's a spiral. And it just would spiral and spiral and spiral. And, and those aren't fun to clean up. I'd rather like Marcus was like, yeah, we'll teach them how to clean up spirals. And I'm like, cool. I would just rebuild the, the arm. <laughs> that's, that's how much I hate cleaning up spirals. I'll, I'll rebuild an arm before I go and clean up the spirals. Uh, so yeah. Yep. All right. So 3d coats, speaking of the devil, here he is. Uh, so this is what 3d coat looks like. I just wanted to show you guys the interface, but basically you guys can see this is the high res mesh. And it, again, it's just another tool you can use for retopologizing. What we're seeing here is somebody's going in and it's kind of cool because you do one side and it does it on the other side for you. Kind of like ZBrush has the symmetry, um, but it will do that for you. And we're seeing like, what do we, we probably have a couple million polygons here, if not eight or nine million polygons in this face. And then we're drastically reducing that poly count here. So there's 3D code and that's what that looks like. They do have some auto resurfacing in this as well. It's again, it's, they're getting there. And someday I know it's going to just be like, oh, I need to resurface this. Here's my resurface button and it'll be done. And it might be perfect and that'll be amazing. But for now, it's not. So, yeah, I can't wait for that day because I know resurfacing. I'm like, eh, resurfacing. It's, it's kind of relaxing, though. You just sit down and start laying down your points and put on your headphones, listen to some sweet jams. You're good to go. Uh, this is Topo Gun. A lot of the tools in Topo Gun are really similar to what we're seeing in Maya now with the resurfacing tools. Actually, if you look at it, it does look similar. How many of you guys have used the Quadra before? Has anybody tried it? I know somebody was saying they were reading about it. Not yet. Okay, cool. Just started reading about it. So you'll see I have a screen grab coming up of what the... Um, resurfacing and quadra looks like inside of Maya and you'll see it looks really similar to this because you know Maya's is they're just borrowing stuff it's okay <laughs> it makes the whole 3d community better all right uh, Mudbox Mudbox has resurfacing as well um, they do have some kind of auto resurfacing um, they do have a way that you can go in and draw the points I've never tried resurfacing inside of Mudbox um, just because I'm, I'm kind of like, I'll just do it in Maya now that they have the sweet tools to do it and I'll do it by hand and I don't want to mess with auto stuff because I'd rather do it once and get it done right once. Um, but this is a little character that they did. You can see they, they kind of get some good stuff in there. I mean, but then if you look like we can look at this edge, it kind of just stops and we might want to keep some radials going around there, right? So it deforms correctly. So you can see it does... It does kind of mess up. Um, is Mudbox a good tool? It it has really, really strong texturing abilities. Um, you can texture in layers like Photoshop, and I love it for that. Um, sculpting, it's not quite as strong as ZBrush yet. It could get there, um, but they really haven't pushed the sculpting abilities as much as ZBrush has. Um, but the, the poly painting, like if I had to pick between... ZBrush and Mudbox, I'd, I would pick Mudbox just because of the ability to use layers and it's, it's really nice. <laughs> uh, but Mudbox is a really strong tool too. And sometimes, um, you know, you'll find that if you go to a smaller studio, they'll probably purchase just an Autodesk package and just get Mudbox with Maya. And there you go. And you might not have ZBrush or they might just be cranking out 3D models all the time for 3D printing and they might not have Maya. They might just have ZBrush. So it's good to familiar familiarize yourselves with all the different packages just so that whatever job you're preparing for, whether it's the small studio that just said, oh, let's just get Autodesk or the bigger studio that's like, let's get everything. <laughs> it's good to know that, hey, I know how to use Mudbox and just jump in and start playing with it. Um, it, it is pretty cool. It's, I like the ability in Mudbox and you can jump back and forth pretty nice. Like Mudbox, you can go, okay, I want to go back to Maya, bring it back to Mudbox, back to Maya. And I know that ZBrush has the go Z button that you can set up to go and do that. But yes. And yes, it is a very intense <laughs> learning process. There's a lot to learn. It's all those little tiny ZBrush menus that I know Joshua, I know you hate those. <laughs> but yeah, I, I can, uh, I can totally understand. I think like, like I was telling you guys last week, um, the thing that always makes me crazy with sculpting is I'm, 
I'm, I'm more of a Maya modeler. So when I have to get the sculpting, I'm like, I want to move that vertice and I want it to be perfect and it's going to look right and perfect. And then I get inside a ZBrush and I have to let that side of me go and I have to be more messy and then learn to tone it down and smooth it out and just deal with it. And that part of me is after modeling inside of Maya for so long, it's so hard for me to get rid of that. Oh, just, just block it in. It's okay. It, and I can understand where you guys are coming from because still to this day, I'm like, I'm going to put this shader on so I could see every little tiny bump that I don't like and I'm going to smooth the crap out of my model so it looks perfect and it's it that is something that I just have to learn to let go so I see Douglas you're like yes see I totally get you guys I get it I know it's hard to just be like hey ZBrush I want to do this and then when it totally messes up not just to like throw your computer like oh, stupid thing <laughs> I get it I totally get it all right so we talked about mud box resurfacing let me get back on track here Yes, the surgical precision. I'm so OCD with my Maya and moving around my little vertices. Oh my goodness, it has translated into my house. Like, I'm like, let me put everything in its place and where it goes. It's really bad. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about the Maya resurfacing and Quadra. Okay, so this is what you guys are going to be using for your assignment. Um, I know we talked about other things that you can use. But because Maya is going to be something that pretty much if you're at the small studio or the big studio, they're going to have this, right? They're, they're pretty much going to have Maya. Um, so it's good to know this, right? If you go in somewhere else and you're like, yeah, I need to have uh, 3D coat and, and topo gun, they're going to look at you like, okay, did you bring it? If you're at a smaller place, they're, okay, that's nice. Do you have it? <laughs> um, but if you're, if you're at if that smaller place has Maya, then you know that these tools are always going to be there. Um, so that's why we try to get you guys prepared with the Quadra tool. Plus, it's it's come such a, a it's it's come such a ways from what it was before. Um, before you would actually make the model live, put it on a rendering layer, and then use the Create Polygon tool and draw out faces. And then you would go in by hand and merge all the vertices after you've drawn out every little face and it it worked that's what I was used to but this is amazing it's like it's like somebody handed me a big bowl of candy and was like have fun and I'm like okay cool let's go so quadra this is in the modeling toolkits all right this is what it looks like so remember how I was saying it looks a lot like topo gun if we look back here we see the black thick lines they're plotting in their points we look here thick black lines are plotting in it's it's the same they they all do the same thing you're plotting in faces we're getting cleaner edge flow or we're reducing geometry so that we can animate all right so let's talk about a typical process okay from uh, zbrush into maya now give me one moment here okay so a typical process from ZBrush to Maya, because we, we know these sculpts and we know Maya and what we have in Maya and you're going, okay, how do I get the sculpt into Maya without this thing crashing? Because you guys know Maya is like, what? That's got how many polygons? No. And then it'll crash, right? You're sitting there with even 200,000 polygons and it freaks out sometimes. So what we do is we use a tool called Decimation Master. Inside of ZBrush, it's a plugin. It's actually in the plugins dropdown. And what you can do is you can decimate your geometry so that it holds the high res details that you sculpted in. So, like if we look in areas here, like in the corner of the eye, and then if we look in larger areas, like the forehead here, you can see that the density in here is much tighter than the density up here because we really don't need as much density here to support that shape as we would down here. So that's what it does. It automatically goes in and says, okay, how many polygons do you want this to be? And then you're like, all right, well, let's do about 500,000 or 200,000. And then it will say, okay, it'll just look at places that have the highest detail and it'll pump it out. So let me get you guys. Oh, there's a slide that talks about it. How convenient. So decimation master, you guys can see here. Um, again, it's used to reduce the poly count of a sculpt while keeping all the high res sculpted amazing details. Um, so it, it just helps you to export that detailed sculpt into, into Maya so that you still have the detail that you sculpted in, but you're not bringing in a 
5 million polygon mesh into Maya. Now Maya has gotten better um, as far as being able to handle high poly models, but it, it's not like ZBrush where ZBrush is like, how many polygons? 9 million. Okay. It, it can handle it. But then Maya is just like, <laughs> you're cute. No, that's not going to happen. So as you guys can see, Destination Master Douglas, you said you use that. Cool. Did you use it in MCR? Or do you remember what class you use that in? Oh, for the pillow project. Okay. Yep. Sounds about right to me. <laughs> okay. So you have your decimated geometry and remember what this looks like. Cause it might be on a quiz might be <clears throat> hint. Um, so remember what that looks like. It's all triangulated to death. We couldn't use this to animate, right? Cause that's just a mess, but it is nice for bringing in to Maya. So we take that decimated geometry export it as an OBJ and then import that into Maya. And then what we do is we take that decimated mesh, you make it live and you use that as a source mesh. Now source mesh, you're going to hear me saying a lot. Um, this is our term for the high res sculpted mesh that we are going to be resurfacing. Okay. And then what you do is you're going to activate the modeling toolkit. And then by making the mesh live, it lets you snap these faces right to your sculpt, which is it's pretty cool, right? Yeah, it's awesome. So let's take a look here. What else do I have? All right, some hints and tips. Get familiar with your hotkeys. This is something I'm still working on because from 2014 to 2015, they changed them. And I was like, all right, I got it, 2014. And they're like, hey, new version, new hotkeys. And I was like, are you kidding me? Um, <laughs> so let's see here. I do have a link for you guys. So I'll send that to you. There, those are the hotkeys for the Quadra. Um, and I'll actually open this. Now, for those of you watching the archive, you can go into the Autodesk Help and look in Modeling Toolkit Hotkeys. And you'll be able to go down here. You just scroll down. Snapping. There we go. Quadra tool. Okay, so these are all of the things you can do in all the nice hotkeys. I have the worst time, sometimes I have the hardest time learning hotkeys, but then I find myself like, you know, I, I have to make it a game because like if I'm sitting there and I switch from 2014 to 2015, I thought I had it and then they changed it. Um, but you know, we learn, we learn combos inside of video games all the time, sort of fatalities and stuff, so. We can learn hotkeys. That's not so bad, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. Next one. Totally. That's right. <laughs> all right. So plan and attack. We had you guys doing all these contours and evolving those into those wire draws so that this week you're not just blindly going in and drawing quad draw strips and making a mess. Okay. So this week, I know you guys, it, it does take a long time to contour and take that into wireframe. But if you even just take five minutes just to kind of roughly sketch it out, um, it helps you to get to see, okay, for these little folds here, um, we can see that a diamond junction was used to expand that area. Right? So we need to know these areas and know when, hey, it's going to be time to use these certain junctions. And now I know Sorry about that. I know that um, this week you guys are going to be learning more about the junctions, right? The, the uh, box junction and diamond junction because you're doing the ear attachment. So we know that diamond junctions, we could look here, they're used to expand and to add more geometry. And box junctions can do the same. And so we have another image here. There we go. So somebody made Roger and uh, you guys can see, <laughs> um, but Marcus just quickly went in and helped him out and said, all right, you want to go ahead and resurface it. So this is actually something Marcus drew up for him. And I apologize for all the background noise. Um, my cat found a fortune cookie and decided it's time to play with it. Thank you. Cool. Okay. So 
Uh, let's see what you guys are saying in chat here. It seems like diamond junctions always create star junctions too. Um, yeah, yeah, they do. Um, but if those are in non-deforming areas, you're okay. Like we're probably not going to see the side of his head move around too much. Or even when you're doing the ear, if you decide, well, maybe I want to use a diamond junction instead. Um, again, that's the side of his face. So it's really not going to deform unless it's down. You move it down towards the cheek where that's really going to deform. Right. So it's just knowing placement and where to put those things. Um, and knowing, okay, I need to use it here. Let's add it. Let's take it away. All right, so um, we're going to actually jump into Maya now so I can show you guys what you're going to be given and how to get started. And what you're going to be given for the assignment is we're going to give you guys, let's see here, you're going to end up having a mesh that's already been triangulated to death with the decimation master, okay? So we can take a better look at this. And as you guys can see, it can be a mess. This can never be animated. I mean, someday maybe in the future when we have holograms and stuff. But for now, unfortunately, it's too dense, even, even when it's decimated. Um, so you're going to have this geometry, and then you're going to start resurfacing. So how do we get started? Now, I'm moving my go-to training panel off to the side. If I don't answer your questions right away, um, it's because I kind of moved it so I can see what's going on here. Um, so yeah, all right, so up here on the top of our screen, this is where you can find your modeling toolkit, okay? So if we select this guy and I'm chugging, it's gonna go. Watch, I probably broke something earlier today when I was messing around in here. Usually you can click on this and it will open. It's probably on another, I had two screens plugged in today, so I probably slid it off to the side. <laughs> um, so let me pause my screen really quickly and fix that because I might've broke it. All right, yeah, give me one second guys. All right, hang in there, guys. It's I I can't seem to get it, so I have to mess with my screen settings and all sorts of stuff now. Darn it. Okay, hold on. Okay, so 
earlier I reset Maya and what happened was, this is actually kind of good that this happened so I can show you guys what to do. Um, in my plugin manager, because I reset my preferences, it actually turned off the modeling toolkit. So I was messing with my screen settings for no reason. Hooray. Uh, so what you guys can do, if this happens to you, if you can't click on this icon, and we're in 2015, uh, those of you who have 2014, uh, the hotkeys are going to be different from what I'm showing you tonight. So you're going to probably want to upgrade at this point to 2015. Um, so in 2015, you're going to go to Windows, uh, Setting Preferences, and Plugin Manager. Okay. Yeah, and if you can upgrade, go for it. Um, and in here, and all these plugins, make sure you're under your uh, Maya 2015 contents, Mac OS, blah, 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 blah. You're going to scroll down all the way to M. And there we go, Modeling Toolkit. Make sure it's loaded and auto-loaded. Because if it's not, it won't turn on. So if you reset Maya for some reason because your preferences were messed up, um, that might be why it's not turning on. At least we know how to fix it. Okay, so I got the scene again. Let's, let's try this again. All right, so here's what you guys will end up with. Okay, this is, again, what you'll import into your scene. And what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and click on the modeling toolkit. Okay. And we can turn on Quadra, but before we do this, we want to turn on our live surfaces. Okay. Because what this does again is it lets you snap your Quadra faces right to the mesh. So I'm going to click this button. And as you guys can see, it tells you right away, hey, this mesh is active, and this is what you guys are going to be snapping to. And then up here, it kind of says the name. You can see it says Alien Host High Poly, and it's blue. So that means it's activated. It's good to go. Okay. So we will use our Quadra. And we can start going in and placing points. Okay. So I'm... I'm going to start here. Of course, you guys could be using your, your uh, contours or edge flows that you've drawn out. But for now, I'm just going to start placing points. Okay, and all I'm doing is I use a tablet um, inside of Maya. If you use a tablet, cool. If not, let me know if you would be interested in learning how to set it up. And I'll be more than happy to show you how to set up your pen to work inside of Maya. Okay, so all I did was I did pen tip to the tablet just to draw out the faces, <clears throat> well, the points. And then when I hold down shift and mouse over, it'll show me like a ghost of a, a face that could be there. Now, to confirm that face, I just tap my pen. Now, if you're using your mouse, you just click. Okay, but as you guys can see, really quickly, we can start drawing out our edge flow. Now... What do we actually give geometry and what are we going to rely on our maps for? This is something we need to think about when we're resurfacing. Am I going to go in here and resurface all of these little indents here? Or am I going to leave that to my normal maps or my displacement maps? What's a good way? What, what do we talk about normal maps doing? Uh, normal maps typically... They give us high res, right? They fake that detail, right? But what do they not fake? What do they not do for us that other like displacement maps might do? The actual surface changes, the silhouette, that's right. So if we're looking at an area and you're wondering, hmm, should I resurface this or not? If we look at this little, these little notches, they're really not changing the, the silhouette too much. If something's pushing in, we can typically kind of use that normal map to take care of that. Now for something like this nice crease on the lip or let's see, I have a better example. Maybe something here like these little holes here. You're probably going to want to actually give that actual geometry, okay? Because it's, it's pushing in quite a bit, but for smaller details, not so much. We don't have to worry about it too much. Now like even on this neck here, 
you know, would you want to actually give those geometry, those little neck wrinkles geometry? Probably because they're changing our silhouette. Okay. So when you guys are drawing out edge flow or your contours, make sure that you're going, okay, that's not really changing silhouettes, so I'm not going to worry about adding in contours there, right? Because it's not changing much. So I'm going to go ahead and, um, oh, I saw a question here. Let me scroll up. Is there a video on setting up the tablet in my, no, there isn't, but I can show you guys. It's not a big deal. It's not too bad. So let me finish this and then uh, we'll talk about setting up your pen tip, pen tip and whack them and getting that all set up in Maya. All right. So now do you guys remember when we talked about the relax tool last week? Yes. Okay, cool. Well, as you guys are drawing out your edge flow, all right, let's say that your density I'm going to chop this up. Now, to do this, what I just did, to insert an edge loop, okay, I'm just holding down control. So if I hold down control, you'll see it adds that little edge. And I'm just going to add some in here just to kind of show you guys what will happen. Um, if I hold down shift, so remember how we hold down shift for smoothing um, usually? Well, when we're working inside of Maya 2015 and using the quad draw tool, we can actually use the relax tool or hold down shift to get us the relax tool. So if you're seeing that, oh, maybe your density isn't working, um, or if you don't like how it's looking, if you can actually go in and use the relax tool to kind of help space things out a bit better. Pretty nifty, right? So I can even go in. Just really quickly start moving things around. Maybe I didn't want all those extra edges where I put them. No big deal. Space them out a little bit. And it doesn't have to be perfect right away because, again, we have our handy-dandy relax tool that will kind of try to space things out and help us a little bit as we go. Okay. There we go. It's, it's trying. Again, some of it's going to be done... Well, a lot of it's going to be done by hand, just kind of you, you and the relax tool need to work together. Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. I like that they added that. Now, uh, as you're working inside of the quad draw here, and I'm just going to kind of pan around. Now, if you find that you want to add maybe a, 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 a certain type of junction. Man, I can't get my words out. Uh, <laughs> what you can do, let me go ahead and I'm going to start moving this edge here just to kind of. There we go. All right. So just by placing this edge here, we're not going to get this nice curve that we have wrapping around that nose, right? It's just going to kind of fall away and it doesn't work really nice. So what we can use is, oops, I thought I was still drawing. Thanks. Okay, so what we can actually do is go in and add that awesome diamond junction in there. Now, I would want to probably bring this up to the corner of the nose like that. There we go, something like that, just to kind of give that that wedge shape in there. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to move this up, just like we talked about. And now, you won't always have to sit there and do contours and stuff, um, because eventually you're going to know, I need to put in radials. This is how many points I usually like around the eye. You'll know how to do it just really quick and um, draw out that edge flow. But until you guys get to that point, I highly recommend, without making it mandatory, it's like on the border, but I really want you guys to go in and try just really quickly sketching that edge flow out, okay? Because it's it's quicker to make the mistakes in there and erase them than it is to actually go in and let me make it up, let me let me undo that and let me fix it, right? If you have a plan of attack, it'll be way quicker, way better for you guys. All right, so when we're doing this, I'm gonna go ahead and one two. Let's see, one, two, why aren't you doing, there we go. So it's trying to do it. Sometimes you might actually have to go in and draw more faces. Oh, 
Or more verts, let's see. I thought it placed an edge in there, but I guess it didn't. Uh, how do you delete stuff in Quadra? I have just undo. I use Command Z. Um, I think in the hotkey thing, they say you can hold down Alt. Again, my, I'm, I apologize, but once they change those hotkeys from 2014 to 2015, I'm, I'm not as sharp at them. Um, how would you suggest drawing them in Photoshop? Yeah, I, I would just take a screen grab of my subject. So let's say you have your, your character. Just do, do a quick front view and maybe just a side view, like just go in and screen grab them and just import those screen grabs right into Photoshop and just sketch them out. Take your time, you know, contour it first if it helps you because we know those contour lines are going to be where we really need to loop that geometry, okay? So that's why we had you guys do that in week one and we were like, okay, what's going on here in this image? Why do we have this line going this way? Okay, so remember how I was like, don't trace it. We want to see the inner edges. That's what we're going to be doing now, basically, with the resurfacing. All right, so I would just grab a screen grab from the front and side and just, just quickly sketch it out. You can even import those images, or if you have a second screen, if you have that, um, look at that and use that as you go. Yeah, and I mean, if you guys plan it out first and then do it, really, it's... It's, it's going to save you guys in the long run because um, I know it sounds like a lot because you have to do two torsos. There we go. Now it'll do it. And uh, two heads. But if you're doing, if you're doing the, uh, the drawings for us and taking your time to make that plan, it's not going to be as bad. All right. So as you guys can see here now, of course, I'm going to start moving things around more. Now, Marcus is more precise. <laughs> if you watch Marcus, he's, he rarely ever goes back to move things. I don't know how he does it. Um, but I kind of go in, relax it, move it around, see where, what it looks like, what it's doing. Now, let's say, as you guys are working for some reason, I'm going to go in. Let me, let me make this a mess all of a sudden. All right. So let's say you're working and then, oh man, my resurface geometry is now showing me edges and I can't get the quadra to work again. Um, don't panic. It's not a big deal. Just grab it in object mode. Okay. And you can turn on a little power button here again and that will just activate it so that it's back in quadra mode. All right. So it's not a huge deal. They made it, they made it really nice. All right. So, I have an example to show you guys. Are there, well, actually, I have a couple more things I could show you. Whoops. Um, a really cool thing that they put in here um, is this extend feature. Now, to do this, I'm just holding down tab. But I want to show you guys what this does. So I'm holding down tab, placing. Okay, so what it does is you can actually pull out a face. And I know it's hard to see. There we go. It's kind of doing it better. This isn't perfect. It's going to look awful. Uh, but you can actually hold down tab, pull out your edges. And then as you move these vertices close to other ones, they automatically snap and merge for you. So that's another option if you want to use that. Very cool, right? Um, so again, this is holding down tab and it, it'll say extend. You guys see that? Extend. There you go. So that's how you know you're at that. You've got that tool for working for you. But again, if you guys check out those hotkeys, I believe they're here, we can see, there we go, the tab and drag. Now, if you do tab, middle mouse drag, and I'll show you guys what that does. Okay, so I'm gonna hold down, whoops, let me get back in here first. Slow down, tab and middle mouse drag, it grabs the entire edge. Now, when I let go, you see it. Grabs that entire edge and pulls it out or moves it out for you, so. Let's say I want to add an edge that kind of loops around here. Again, tab, middle mouse drag. Oh, okay, middle mouse drag. And it just snapped it right to the little face I already had there and looped it right in. Now, this is not perfect by any means. We'd probably have to go in and keep adjusting our edge flow. But it gives us a nice start. I mean, if you already have that edge drawn in and you already know, I'm going to have to pull this out and this edge is going to need to support this shape here. 
it's just really nice to just really quickly do that. Now, again, put on some tunes, relax when you're doing this. Don't stress out too much. Um, cause we know this is the first time you guys are really getting in and doing this. And if ever there's any questions or concerns, or if you feel like you're not sure you're on the right track, just reach out to us. Okay. We'll tell you. All right. So I want to show you guys, um, let me go ahead and get rid of that. And I'll show you guys an uh, example. Okay, so what we have here, I'm gonna actually slide this over so we can look at this. Okay, what this is, is this is Ziri Mesher. Remember how I talked about the auto resurfacing? So it, just off the bat, I mean, it didn't, it doesn't have too many bad things. We have a nice radial around the mouth. Uh, but if we look up here, we've got really strange stuff sweeping around and coming back out. So this is where it kind of just, it does some weird stuff, right? So this is stuff that was kind of cleaned up. We, you can see we have a uh, Diamond Junction here that expanded. I know it's really hard to see. Let me see if I can. But like this, we have a, a diamond junction within a diamond junction. That's It's kind of messy, right? Um, so it does an okay job. And this is with a lot of control curves. Okay, so those are the curves we kind of draw in and say, follow this, and it tries to follow that. It doesn't do too bad, but still, there's a lot of stuff that we would want to fix, especially when I see stuff doing that. That's just really strange. Weird looping. Um, and then if we look here at a resurface, I believe a student did this one. Um, this was from Marcus's campus class. But if we look at this, this is a resurface for this guy. Now there's some good things going on and some things that we'd probably want to adjust. For example, uh, actually I'll ask you guys, what are some good things that we're seeing in this model? Density, density is not too bad. It's not super dense, right? But we could probably, we could probably do a little bit more in some areas. Um, it's really erratic. We're seeing a lot of jaggedness. Yeah, we see our radials. So that's good. Mm -hmm. Now, what are some things that we could maybe adjust or something that we probably should have t uh, taken more time on? Let's look at... More density probably, yeah, I could probably go with a little bit more density, especially for circular areas like this. Um, this one was done a lot better, but this one, it's just, that's really not enough to hold that shape, right? A lot of the detail was lost, right? Um, and again, we have the maps, like if we look at the back of the head here, look at the silhouette here, and then if I flip it and look this way, we're missing a lot of this really nice, smooth curvature. So this would be an area where we would probably have to go in and reevaluate that and say, okay, well, maybe this is an area where I can throw in a diamond junction, right? So if we did something like this, and we'll pretend it's mirrored, okay, and then deleted that edge there, we would have more geometry to work with, right? And that would actually give us more than just kind of two edges to hold that shape. It needs a lot more geometry because, like, even just looking at it, if we only did three points, you know, remember, you guys remember watching Pee Wee Herman? When your kids connect the dots and you would sing the song and connect all the dots, Three edges, three little vertices is not going to be enough to get that nice smooth arc. We're going to get a sharp edge. So if you, you can even look at this and kind of map it. Maybe even four would be a little better. 
possibly even five edges or vertices along that silhouette to hold that arc. Okay. So there's good things in it. There's also things that could be adjusted. And we have this nice sharp detail here where I started um, actually resurfacing and it's kind of, it's kind of lost here. Where'd it go? Um, and also this nice sharp crease on the lip. It's kind of there, um, but we would also, we would want to probably think of things that we learned in MCR even, tying this back into, that's a sharper edge. What do we do when even a, a hard surface model has a sharper edge? What, what is something we would do when we're modeling? You would pin in that holding edge, right? And, and you would make sure that those edges were closer together to get that shape. So think back, everything's building on each other. Um, so now is the time to really, if, you, if, if you're confused about what holding edges are or even when to use them, look back at your MCR notes, okay? And I, I know this part was relatively short, but are there any questions on how to use the resurfacing tool or when to resurface or what you should be resurfacing? So for your resurfacing assignment, you're going to have to do two heads and two torsos. Don't try to do all of them because you'll go crazy. <laughs> yes, this is one of the models. Yeah, it is pretty cool. I think he's he's got a lot of fun features, um, a lot of nice details in him that you'll really sit down and, you know, guys, if you want, now this is something that I think would be a good idea, um, but after you're done drawing out your edge flow, why not bring it to us in our open lab or during my open office hours and get the feedback then before you jump in and start resurfacing. This way you know, hey, Michelle told me I should add stuff here. Let me go ahead and sketch that out and then go ahead and start resurfacing. This way you're only erasing lines rather than doing too much work inside of Maya. And yes, it is in the week three folder. Are there any other questions? Um, I, th I believe there are OBJ files that you'll be importing into your own scene. We can take a look together. Why not? We'll check it out and see what we have. I'm pretty sure they're just OBJ files. Let's check and see. Okay, week three, resurfacing. Now, you guys see here, we have edge flow guides. Okay, don't be afraid to check these out and check out the head. There's lots of head wireframes here. And even the one from the video where Marcus had actually went in and drawn out the edge flow, well, he went in and started resurfacing with that. It's pretty cool to see it put into play. Yes, all the resurfacing needs to be done in Maya. I mean, if you try to use Ziri Mesher, we know that we know the type of errors it does, and we'll know that you guys used it. So please do not use Ziri Mesher. I don't want to see you guys get zeros, okay? Um, but, oh, there's a video. This video is actually pretty cool inside of the, the head folder here for all the wire draws. Let me see. Not the wire draws, but the edge flow guides, rather. This is pretty cool because it goes in and highlights all of the loops we should be seeing. So if you're doing a basic female, let's say, we would see these edge loops, right? So this might help you guys. Yeah, they're pretty awesome. I like them. I saw, I saw it and I was like, oh, that, that was pretty cool. Don't save, geez. Okay. Um, so here's our heads for resurfacing. You guys will pick two of these. That was the ugliest two I've ever drawn. And then you guys will go into the torso folder and grab two of these. That's a little better. Okay. So that's where to find those. And now we know they're OBJs. You're going to import those into a Maya scene and you're good to go. And remember, they're already decimated. You don't have to worry about that. You just can jump right in, take some screen grabs, contour it out, or uh, draw your wire draws on them, and then just start using them and resurfacing. Are there any questions on how to get started or where to find those tools or the plugin? No? Okay, well, 
Um, I'm going to show you guys really quickly how to use Maya and your tablet. Have you, any of you actually used your tablet with Maya before? No. Did you even know it's possible? Yeah. Okay. So a couple of you did. That's cool. All right. So um, I've got my tablet plugged in, and what you what we want to do. Well, he advises against it for his class, but I'm totally fine with you guys using it for my class. In fact, I encourage you guys to do it um, because holding a pen and using that inside of Maya and using the tablet is much more of a natural shape for your hand to be in rather than the eagle claw that's gripping your mouse all day, right? Because if you... I know in the background you probably hear me cracking my wrist all the time. I, I get the worst cramps in my hand in carpal tunnel from working in the industry for 10 years. I, it's, it's awful. So occasionally you hear all these little popping noises. Um, that's when I'm using my mouse. Um, but save your careers, you guys. Learn how to do this. It will help. All right. Yeah, it's easier on the wrist, and I find it more accurate once you get used to it. It's, it's again, that learning curve. At first, you're like, this sucks. I hate it. <laughs> and that's that's how I was. I was like, this is dumb. But once I realized, wow, my hand doesn't hurt anymore. This is great. Oh, yeah. Well, my mouse has like 13 buttons. So there you go. <laughs> Us kids in our gaming mice, right? Is that what you're using? <laughs> All right. So what we're going to do is in your Wacom tablet settings here, we're going to make sure that our pen is set up correctly. So what we want to do is make sure our pen tip, that's going to be set to click by default, our bottom pen toggle. So when I talk about the pen toggle, I'm talking about that little switch on the side of your pen. The bottom, we're going to set up to middle click. So to do that, you just hit the drop down here and switch it to middle click. And then the top toggle on the pen, I set to right click. And again, you just hit the drop down, go to clicks, right click. Okay, so if you guys want to screen grab this for reference, go for it. You guys get that screen grab? I I wish I had the wireless because my little cable, I'm like, I've got maybe three feet and I have to hunch all up over my computer. <laughs> um, I know, it, give it a shot. Maybe try it just for placing the points on your on your model, okay? Just to just to give it a shot. Just put a sphere in the scene and I'll, I'll do that for you guys. I'll show you. Um, so once this is set up, uh, when we go inside of Maya, wherever that went, there he is. Okay, so... What you guys can do is just go make a, make a sphere in the scene, scale it up, okay, and just use this to kind of practice maneuvering around. So I'm going to tell you guys how to maneuver because this is where it, you, you're going to probably be like, I don't like this, but it's okay. Nobody likes new things. I know I don't. I hate change. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to just um, – let me use my handy dandy sculpt geometry tool and I'm going to make this ugly so we know that we're rotating. Here we go. Oh, also using the sculpt geometry tool with your pen, way cooler than trying to do it with a mouse. All right, so now we can kind of see it rotating around. Cool. All right, so first things first. Um, if your pen is set up just like mine, you're going to use the option button, okay? Pen tips to the tablet, no buttons pressed. This is this option or alt pen tip to the tablet. This is our rotate, okay? Now, if I hit the bottom toggle on the pen with alt held down, now, this is where it gets a little strange, okay? I'm going to just, just tell you right now. Um, to use this, you have to hover the pen tip over the tablet, okay? Because if you touch the pen tip to the tablet after activating pan, it turns to zoom. 
Okay, so again, all it's pen tip to the tablet. Actually, no, no pen tip to the tablet. I lied. We're hovering the pen over the tablet. Now I usually hover it maybe like a finger's width away from the tablet. I'm gonna I was like, that works? That's so weird, but it does. It actually does. So that turns to pan. And then if we touch the pen tip to the tablet, we get zoom. So if we if we try to do it without yeah, if you don't hover that pen tip, it doesn't want to work with you. It's like, nope, not happening. Okay. So again, alt, bottom pen toggle. Hover that pen tip over the tablet. That's our pan. Now, while this has the pan icon, if you pitch your pen tip to the tablet, it quickly changes to zoom. Now, at first I was like, why did they set it up this way? But the more I did it, I was like, wow, that, that can actually be pretty quick. Now, if you don't like using that method to get to zoom, you can just use the top toggle on the pen and that's always zoom with uh, alt or option held down. Okay. So either the top toggle or pan, pen tip to the tablet, that's zoom. Are there any questions on how to maneuver around inside of Maya? Um, I just use the default little plastic black tip uh, because I dropped my thing with extra tips and that's the one I have. <laughs> um, but if you prefer one that's, um, I know they have the one that has a little bit more grip to it, like the, uh, the white one. Yeah, you can use that one. Just try them out and see what feels most comfortable to you. This one's pretty quick because it just kind of glides over the surface and you're good to go. Um, but again, it's up to you. Now, it's cool because once we have this, we can just, you know, top pen toggle. We get all of our components for the hot box that pops up. Oh, is that like a pop-up box? I heard somebody, I heard a student calling it the hot box. I don't, I don't know what to call it. I just, it's just there. There you go. Vertices, object mode. It's really pretty quick to jump around. Um, and again, if you're using the sculpt geometry tool, it's pretty cool. We can just smooth things right out. And it, it, it'll look at pressure sensitivity too. So it's pretty awesome. It's not perfect, but hey, it, it works. So practice it. Um, I know it's just another thing that we added, but hey, if you get used to it, if you get get used to these tablets, because I know when I went um, to EA, they they just gave you a tablet. There was no mouse. I guess they, they just assumed that, there you go, you're an artist, there's your tablet. Okay, so get used to it, because that might be a situation you might run into. Okay. Now I'm sure we can ask, you know, hey, uh, IT, can I get a mouse? But meh. <laughs> that's good to hear. I know, I know some students will tell me, well, I can't work with this. I need a Cintiq. And I'm like, well, you kind of probably won't ever get a Cintiq in the industry unless you take your Zen, I guess, if they let you take things in. So just get used to using these. Yeah. And the Cintiqs are so expensive, right? Guy? Oh my gosh. I'm like, hmm, do I want a new kitchen or do I want a Cintiq? <laughs> I know it's like that dream thing that's set on the back burner forever. Man. Yes. Yeah, someday. <laughs> okay. So one last time, are there any questions on maneuvering around in Maya with uh, the pen or maybe anything with the resurfacing assignment? Nope. Okay, cool. Let's jump into talking about UVs and your UV assignments. See, I added this cause I thought it was funny. Cause I always have somebody that goes, I hate UVs. <laughs> That used to be me. Maybe that's me from back in the day. All right, so what do we know about UVs? What are UVs used for? What what are UVs? Used to place textures, textures, okay, yep. Good, good, so that's a good start. Uh, so if I were to go ahead and UV a model right now, what would I need to know? Optimizing texture space, yeah. Mapping, using that zero to one space as efficiently as possible. 
So I'm going to go in, yeah, how to find the texture editor window, probably how to create UVs. Sometimes you'll get models, maybe even your UV assignment, that don't even have UVs. And you might have to create UVs to then cut all your seams into. So what is a UV collage? Have you guys heard of that before? I'm sure you have. No? Cut up UVs. This is a UV collage. That's just a fancy way. Um, that's our zero to one space. There we go. Zero to one space with all the UVs for the model. So that's our UV collage. This is just a UV snapshot of a UV collage, but that's that's the fancy term for it. So when you guys are doing vocab with your family and you want to sound super awesome like I used to, this is <laughs> yeah I uh, I got check out this UV collage I put together. It's so cool. All right, so that in combination with our textures will give us a textured character. So there's our UV collage, and that's combined with that. This is actually Marcus modeled himself like a Team Fortress character with a full sale. You guys can see the little full sale logo. <laughs> uh, we were making like this cool like CDC world that was going to be inside of Second Life that we would have you guys go to for all of your videos and stuff. But we were told we're not allowed to let you guys go and do Second Life with us. So that idea got scrapped. Boo. Um, and it's pretty cool though. Yeah, it was going to be awesome. But there are places in Second Life that can be scary, and that's what we were told. Yeah, that was a major concern. So we were like, oh, okay. So all of our awesome models that we made were not used. But now we can use them for class examples. So hey, whatever. <laughs> all right, so what are some issues that we can run into when laying out UVs? Seems that's a good one. What else? Overlapping UVs that'll give us some weird artifacts, right? Or sometimes we want them to overlap. Stretching, right? So, you guys got it. Seam stretching and distortion. Um, and Joshua, we'll talk about overlapping UVs here in a moment because I'm, I'm really glad you brought that one up. All right, so what do we know about? seam stretching and distortion. They happen all the time. They're kind of a pain in the butt, but they can be worked out, right? We have our unfold and relax and unfold some more. Um, where do we place our seams? Where are some good places, let's say on a human character, standing in T-pose, where would we want to place some seams? Unseen areas. Hairlines, that's a good one. Back of the head. Yep, it's another good one. Maybe the best way to think of where to put seams on a human model is look at the seams where your clothing line up, right? Look at where your seam for your shirt is on your sleeve, under the arm. That'll be hidden. Or even on the sides of your shirt, you always have the seams running down the sides. So those are usually pretty good places to run those seams. Yeah, so the inseam. That's right, so... We know our characters and we know it's important to pit these seams in these areas because why? Why do we why do we hide the seams? And I was kind of like, well, I just kind of answered that, but why do we why do we sit there and spend all that time pitting? Yeah, so the textures look good. So we, so we don't see these ugly weird seams all over our character. Like if you're in a game, and your camera is a third person camera and you have a big seam running down your, your character's neck and your camera's always there, you might not have wanted to put that seam right at the back of his neck, right? You might want to move it to the sides. Um, so why do modelers lay out UVs? You know, in the industry, you'd think there's modeling section, UV section, and then the texturing guys, or maybe the guys who do the textures lay out UVs, but why? all of a sudden you're sitting at your desk as a modeler and they're like, okay, when you have all the UVs laid out, take that to texturing. Yes, because they know the model. You guys resurfaced the thing. You sculpted the thing. You know why you place the seam right down the center of the torso or maybe hidden 
at the waist somewhere, you know why you put those there. And that was to hide your UV seams later on. Okay. So you guys know the model the best. That's your baby. You've been working on it for two weeks. So that's why they have you guys lay out UVs. So we're, we've been talking about stretching and distortion and seams. When is distortion okay? Yeah, in places that aren't seen in the, maybe the seams. Now this is kind of a trick question, but if we have UV distortion, um, and a lot of times if we look at game UVs, which we will be in a minute here, a lot of the times they square off their UVs. So you would think by lining up all of our edges in a, in a shell that we're going to end up with really distorted UVs when we do. But if we're hand painting our textures using something like Mudbox or ZBrush, though by painting on the model, it will compensate for that distortion in our UVs. So we don't have to really worry about distortion in the UVs if we're hand painting those textures. Okay. Now what happens on a zero to one space? Yeah, it is cool. That's why I like hand painting now. <laughs> they repeat. That's right. They will repeat. So sometimes it's okay to do that. Like, let's say, how many of you played WoW? Probably a bunch of you. Still do. Yeah, okay. So when you walk by those waterfalls in the older zones, let's say, <laughs> um, and you're looking at it, you know that that's not particles or simulations. You look at that, and that's actually a – let me kind of draw this out for you guys. So here's our – Here's our handy dandy texture editor. And this is our zero to one space. What they do is they'll actually, let me change colors. Uh, where's green? There it is. No, that's not green, that's blue. There we go. What they'll do is they'll map to that zero to one space. Okay. And they'll put a texture in there that looks like blurred water like this. And they'll actually take this shell and key it moving down. So it'll look like that water is moving downwards, but really all we're doing is animating our UVs on our texture editor. So it looks like it's flowing water, but really we're just moving UVs on a surface that's not even moving. It's all smoke and mirrors with games. Does that make sense or did I confuse everybody even more? Wow, pun intended. <laughs> it is pretty cool. So, you know, Sometimes it's not a bad thing to go out of our zero to one space. And sometimes it's not bad to have mirroring on things even. So we're going to talk about that more in a minute. Um, so use your UV space efficiently. So before we talk about our awesome mirroring and stuff, we're going to talk about using your space efficiently. And yeah, Joshua was just like that with the looping backgrounds. That would be something that we could do just by grabbing that UV shell that's mapped in that zero to one space and moving it to the right. Or if the character's running the other way, move it the other way and key it. All smoke and mirrors, man, I'm telling you. <laughs> All right, so use your UV space efficiently. This is a texture, an actual texture from The Last of Us, just for a backpack. Look how efficient and beautiful this is. And as artists, I know all of you are totally drooling right now. It's beautiful, right? Absolutely gorgeous. This is only a backpack. It's crazy, right? So look at the backpack when it's all textured. It looks really, really good. So that is what we're talking about. We're saying use that UV zero to one space efficiently. Now, I wanted to show you guys an example. I don't have the UV shells, but you guys can kind of look here and see the separate shells. Now I'm not going to trace perfectly because I'm not that good. There we go. We can see the separate little shells. And remember how I talked about um, squaring off the UVs? Well, what they're doing here is they're actually taking all of their shells that they unfold and they're just laying out, they're snapping these in straight lines all the way across. It's very grid-like, but they use their zero to one space incredibly efficiently. I mean, look at, there's really nothing that's not used here other than like here. <laughs> There's, it's, it's really nicely done. But if we look at the texture, we know this is a plaid shirt. Okay, but look at what's going on with the 
the the lines in that shirt they're all wonky and awful looking but i guarantee you that they look really nice on the model because these were hand painted okay so our uvs might not be relaxed and laid out into perfect shells and they might be snapped into squares but because these are hand painted textures we're compensating the program that we're painting in is compensating for that pretty cool right i mean look that's really nice use of zero to one space so I wanted to show you guys a face laid out in zero to one space super efficiently because it's really funny looking one. And so you guys can see what people do when they're texturing heads and where they place their seams. So if we're looking here, we can tell right away, well, here's one seam and they probably cut along the back of the head to the middle of the head so they can get this flare. Okay, they have a piece of an ear up here. <laughs> It's kind of weird to see. So this is, I think the guy's name is Joel or the main character. I haven't played The Last of Us. I downloaded it over Christmas, but I haven't even opened it yet. I know. I, mean, I want to play it so bad. But this is the main character from that. And again, we're seeing a lot of areas that, you know, you wouldn't really think of how these are put together. These are all hand painted. Now, these are a lot of projection maps too. A lot of maybe using the... Um, Spotlight, remember how we use Spotlight and we turned off the projection painting? They might have had a face in the front view. They laid it over their character's face and just painted with the brush through and then fix it up by hand. Um, it's, real, it's not that bad. It's pretty cool. Um, but I wanted to show you guys also that a lot of the hair and the facial hair is actually painted on. Because what they do over this is they lay all the cards on top of this that give it that silhouette and depth. It looks, that's how they kind of make it so that you're not just seeing skin. They also do the same under the hair. They kind of airbrush it along the hairline because if you look at somebody's hairline, it's not like skin all the way back. It's got some shadow to it because of all the hair. So that's why they paint it that way. <laughs> all right. Um, let's keep going down here. All right. So... Before we jump into the week three lecture activity, I want to kind of jump into your assignment and show you guys what we're expecting from you and how to get started and why we kind of set this up the way we did. So for your assignments, you're going to be taking this guy. I'm sure he's going to look really familiar to you in a moment here. Yes, I know it's a student version. Thank you. Oh, look who it is. It's our best buddy in the whole world, right? So we're going to be taking him, and we're going to be looking at, let's see, is this it? It's the gray guy, this UV snapshot, okay? You guys are going to have this, and you're going to look at this, and then lay out your UVs to match this UV snapshot so that you can apply either, oh, that's not it, that's not it, where is it? This texture, I believe you guys have another texture, but I don't, oh, maybe this is it. Nope. Nope, that's not it. Okay, so you guys have the Full Sail Tron texture, which is this one that I did, and then you have the Full Sail Racer one that Marcus did. Okay, so you're going to pick one of those textures and apply that to your character, and if it lines up and matches, then this texture will look perfect on your character. Okay, so you're kind of working backwards. Now, so you're probably sitting there going, why did you set up the assignment like that? How come I didn't lay out UVs and then texture? Okay, a lot of times when you guys are working on a game, you guys will have character creators in games. You guys know how you go to shops and you buy different pieces of armor or you get upgrades of armor, right? Or maybe different t-shirts. So when you have these things, you're gonna wanna only paint one texture. And sometimes what you'll do is you'll model a whole bunch of different kind of silhouettes. But let's say that shirt two has a stripe texture. Well, we don't want to have to repaint stripe textures when we already have stripe textures for shirt one. So we match our UVs up exactly on shirt two to the shirt one UV layout so that all of the hundreds of textures we painted for the shirt one will go onto shirt two. Okay, so this does happen in the industry. We will probably see this, especially those of you going into game art. Um, they reuse 
UV layouts so they, we, they can reuse textures. Does that make sense? I know it's confusing probably. Okay, so it does make sense. Cool. So now you know the secret behind how they get so many textures for all these different armor pieces and stuff and all these different shapes and shirts. It's because they're reusing the same layout. Now, a couple of things I want to point out on our UV layout. So let's talk about what these shells are together. Okay, so let's start with this one here. Which one would this be? The head, okay. Yep, that's the head. Now, let's, let me actually, I'm gonna try to squish this next to our, our guy here. Uh, let's see, we'll do this. Now I can't see it, but oh, yay, thank you, Maya. There we go. Okay, so what about this one here? So we know this is the head, the front of the torso. Okay, good. And then this one's probably what? The back, yep. All right, now, where's the, an arm and a leg? I have two arms and two legs. We can look at the knee here, lower left, so we can see that junction in the knee. So here's that junction. So we know this is the leg. Here's our hands. All right, now this is probably an arm. Yep, you guys got it. Where's the rest? Where's the other arm? Where's the other leg? So here's an arm. They're overlapping, yes. These, this is two arms. This is left and right. Same with the hands. I'm just gonna change colors. So same with the hands and the feet, okay? And the leg. So how, how do we do this? What would be the best way and easiest way, because I know you guys like to save time, to lay out our UVs so that they're matched up on top of each other 100% perfectly. Close that out. Well, let's take a look together because I know I'm probably I'm tricking you guys. It's okay, it's kind of fun. All right, so if I were to do this, and I'm sure if you guys were to do it this way too, I would probably just go in here and delete half of them. All right, let me get rid of everything. Okay, just delete half of them. And now let's go into our UV texture editor. I have a custom one here that I'm just gonna open up. Okay, um, I have them selected and there's no UVs. What does that mean? What do I have to do? Go to UV menu, map it. Yeah, I have to create the UVs. So all I'm gonna do is just planar map this. Boom, it's not perfect. It's projecting from the front, which is fine. That's okay. So we have some UVs now at least, right? We're not just sitting here and he's, doesn't have anything. Now I'm using 2015 again, guys. So if something's not working right in 2014 that I'm demoing now, remember this is 2015. Okay. so. Now I wanna go, we're gonna do a little bit of back and forth. Okay, I'm gonna look at this. Here's something I want you guys to try to do to figure out where to place your seams. Use visual landmarks. Okay, so we have, we have a box junction here. Okay, so we know from this outer edge of the box junction, we're gonna count down one, and that's where we wanna place our seam. So let's go in here and take a look. This is so difficult, I got there, there we go. Let me make this bigger because my awesome go to training panel takes up so much space. All right, so here's that box junction we saw, right? I'm gonna go down one. Now we know, just because we talked about this earlier, that we're gonna hide our seams in areas that we're not gonna really see them. So 
we know that it's not going to be up here on the arm or maybe even here because we don't want to have our seams be visible. So we know that that edge that we just counted down is actually this edge here underneath the arm. Okay. So there's one that we know. We're going to place the seam there. And this is a lot easier. I know if you guys have another screen to work on, it's probably a little bit easier to do that. All right. If you don't, you'll be okay still. So now we got to figure out where are we going to put the seam here? Okay, so the best way to do that, again, use that visual landmark. So from the inner box junction, I'm going to count down. So there's one, two, three, cut. Okay, so I'm going to jump back in here. Here's that inner box junction. One, two, three, cut. So that's how you guys are going to be doing this. It's So we can go in, cut our seam. I'm going to just go in here. Remember to cut your edges in, cut those seams, select the edge and click that icon there with the scissors and you'll start cutting the edges or cutting those shells. Yes, we will. You guys will be provided the one that we made, the gray guy that we made. OK. Um, now, another thing that's really helpful when doing this assignment, turn on your texture edges. Now, to do this, go into display, polygons, texture, border edges. Remember how we turned on border edges? Well, this is kind of the same thing, except what it's going to show us is where we cut our seams. Awesome. Thank you, Full Sail. That's so cool. Okay, so go in here, click on that. And you guys know me, I like to make this a little bit thicker. So I'm going to crank this up a bit more so I can see it. I usually put it at like three. There we go. So now I can see I've got a seam there. Now... Let's see where we're going to cut the other seam here for the arm. So we have another junction, that box junction here, which lines up to this. And then we're going to count up one. So we're going to want to cut along this edge here. So let me go ahead and grab those, grab those edges. Or not. Thank you. That's what I get for jumping back to my... My mouse. <laughs> Don't select everything. Thanks, thing. All right. So I'm just going to go in, grab this edge all the way around. Back to the UV texture editor. Cut. Okay, and we know the other one that we're going to do is underneath here. So click that one, shift click. And we have just the edges we selected. Cut that. Now, if we did everything right, we should be able to grab these UVs, select, we want to grab just the shell, and let's see if we can move this out of the way without it being connected. Yay, we did it. Okay, so we did it. That's cool. I like to turn on this. No, that's the new one. Um, the new one's pretty cool because it shows you warping, but this one's kind of the old school one that shows you if there's any overlapping. Um, but now what we're going to do is we're just going to use this tool here. This is our relax and unfold that you just select. And then we just click and drag in here and it'll just kind of boom, lay it out. Just like that, real easy. Um, so what I recommend is cutting your character in half, lay out all your shells. Um, your torso you're not gonna be able to do and your head you're not gonna be able to do. Do your arm, leg, hand, and foot while it's all halved. Mirror it over. And then when you're moving your shells, because you're going to have two shells on top of each other, make sure you drag select and then say select shell. Um, otherwise, what's going to happen is you're only going to be moving one shell on top of the other, and it will not look right. So just for demonstration purposes, I'm going to just mirror this guy over again so you can see what happens. Um, but this is something you guys will be doing when it's all done. So we're mirroring them over. And I still have a texture seam there, but that's okay. Let me go ahead and select them. That will be helpful. Um, but when we look here, this is actually purple now. Okay, because we have one shell that's blue that's facing the right way and one shell that's red. This is okay. That means you did it right. Okay, purple is good in this particular case. So when let me show you guys. When you move this, go to UVs, drag select, select shell, and then move, and it moves both of them, okay? 
if you don't do this again, like if I just grab, if I click and, you, and I do it here, select shell, then I, oh, I messed it up. Okay, and lining that up again, it's going to be really difficult. So make sure you're always drag selecting, select shell, and you, you'll have both of them. All right. Are there any questions on how to mirror everything over or how to find where to place your seams? Um, anything on the UV assignment or any questions on it? Texture edges, okay. Um, again, just to turn that on, you're going to go to display, polygons, and texture border edges. And I'll leave that up so you can screen grab it. Um, but again, if you want to adjust the edge width, it's there. It's highlighted as well for some reason. All right, cool. And you're welcome. All right, so let me kind of Z back here. I'm looking at the clock. We have a little bit of time, um, so I can show you guys some more tricks here. Um, with the leg, again, I'm going to let you guys help me with the leg. So I'm going to pull up this image. And for some reason, I hate how that does that. It makes me crazy. Isn't leaving them on top of each other going to mess with the texture once it's upside down? Um, the only way it would really mess with anything is if we had a normal map. Um, by leaving something upside down, something that, let's say, is supposed to be pulling out would be pushing in on the other arm. So if there's a normal map, then it's not going to really work. But because it's only texture and texture and color information that we're using, um, it, it's okay. This is just so that we use that zero to one space as efficiently as possible. Okay, so look at the leg here. What's something we can use on our UV snapshot? I'm going to close this out. Uh, what can we use on our UV snapshot? Our kneecap. Yeah, because that's like, boom, there he is. Okay, so if we count over from the outer junction here, would this edge be on the outer leg or the inner? On the inseam or the outside? On the inside, right. So there's that one. Okay, so then from the knee, it looks like he actually is wearing boots Right, so we've got gloves because we could see these were cut off early. It's kind of short, so let's count down from the outer edge of this knee. One, two, cut. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and cut in that seam. So we've got one, two, cut this guy. And I don't know if you guys can get it, so I'm sure you can, but if using something like I'm using here, um, that to draw on the screen, like OmniDazzle helps, use it. Uh, I think OmniDazzle is free, and I can actually, let me type that in chat so you guys know what to search for. OmniDazzle. Um, this lets me draw on my screen, and it might help you guys to kind of keep track. And even when you're planning out, you know, if you get to a certain point with your resurfacing and you don't want to resurface, you can actually sketch it really quickly. With OmniDazzle, leave that on your screen and just kind of do your edge flow underneath that. It's almost like a little like whiteboard. So if I turn off my pen and move things, that will stay in place underneath, which is really cool. So download that. Maybe it'll help you guys. Um, if, you're, if it's giving you a hard time, just let me know, and I can help you set up OmniDazzle. Okay, so we have our seam cut there on the leg. Let's figure out. I'm guessing, let's see, we know that knee. I'm guessing it's going to be this edge here where the hip connects to the leg. Let's count real quick. Outer edge, one, two, three, four, cut. All right. Let's see if I was right. Oh, no, I closed it. Oh, well. Um, so outer edge, one, two, three, four, cut. There we go. So I was right. Yeah, yeah. Let me go ahead and... I'm going to just grab this, loop around, see if we got everything. Oops. UV texture editor, cut. And then we know the other one, again, is down the 
inside of the leg. Let's make sure we have the inner piece. There we go. So we've got that inside seam cut. Now if we did it right, the good old test, see if we can select the shell and move it. And we can. Yippee. So what do I do now? Now that I have the leg taken off and my UVs are, we unfold. And it's this one, right? Or is it this one? This one? Tetris. That's a, that's a good way to put it. The Tetris T. I like that. All right. So we unfold that. Uh oh, it's kind of laying on itself. Remember, if it kind of folds in on itself, use the relax like I just did there. Just to kind of relax it a little bit and then unfold it and you're good to go. Okay. So good job. It's not so bad, right? And again, so let me show you guys how to do the, the head really quick um, because that does involve some moving and sewing. So I'm going to just mirror him over because again, once you get to the point where your arms, arms, hands, legs, and, and feet are totally laid out, then we can jump in and do mirror this over and then do the rest. Okay, so we're going to new geometry. We can still see we have that horrible seam, but that's okay. Because what we're going to do actually is we're going to just grab these, these UVs here and a really cool hotkey for you guys. Um, let's say we, right now, this is exactly what I want to lay out UV, UVs for, um, but we need to be in face mode to grab those, right? So if you use function control, F9 through F12, these will toggle between components. So for example, if I do, if I hold down function control, now this is using your Mac, I have to hold down function, otherwise we'll turn our volume up and down. <laughs> we want the function key. So function control, F9, this toggles to verts. F10 will toggle that to faces, or I'm sorry, edges. And F11 will toggle that to faces. And then F12 will take it back to UVs. So let me actually jump back to when I had my UVs. Function control F11, I've got the faces selected right there. Okay, so create UVs. I'm going to planar map that. Go into our UV texture editor. And now we have that all as one piece. And it's okay to move that off to the side. Remember, we can move these guys too. Okay, because we're just doing this so we can see what's going on. So, uh, so if we do function control F9, what does that turn into? Verts. Good job. Uh, what about function control F10? Edges. Yeah, you guys got it. 11, F11. Faces and then verts. That's right. Man, you guys are, or I'm sorry, UVs. See, I, I forgot. <laughs> okay, so we've got those UVs laid out. Um, again, we want to use, let me see if I could do open. Mm, there we go. Yay. Okay, UV snapshot. Um, so looking at this, a good point to use on the torso is this little star junction here. Just to kind of figure out, okay, here's our seam. This looks like it's down the sides, just like our T-shirts. Okay, down the sides, right under your armpits. And then up here, now, this probably connects to the arm, right? So that'll probably give us another point to look for. And then we can count from there. One, two, three, four, five, cut. Okay, so once we get to this point, it's not so bad. Um, it's almost like a quiz in a way, just to get you guys back into the swing of things. So we can actually just grab all of our seams here. And I really like that uh, Maya did this. It's just so much nicer. I'm going to go ahead and just cut those since I grabbed most of them. So let's cut that. And we know we had it probably at the top here. just to get the front of that torso. 
Now, if you're selecting components, let's see if this works, just for fun. If you know you're working, oh, it will work. Okay, cool. If you're working on something that's symmetrical, you can actually go in. I'm going to show you guys how I did this. If you double click your move tool, it'll bring up all these tool settings. Scroll all the way down to the bottom and you actually have symmetry settings right here. Now we can actually turn on world in X because we know right here it says X. We want it to do the other side. So make sure it's X. And then what we can do is we can just go in and grab the edges we need. So, so we know it's the top. I'm not sure where it ends here, but that's okay. We'll figure it out as we go. And both sides are now selected. So now I can just go in, cut those edges, and it does both sides instead of doing just one side. Can you guys see that? So when I did that, it did that side and that side. Nice. Um, so I'm pretty sure this is where that ends. Let's go ahead and cut that. And we're going to need to cut these guys too because we didn't go all the way up like we were supposed to. But hey, look, at I didn't even have to do the other side. Okay, so we've got that. Now let's see if we did it right. Let's just grab the UVs. Oh, this is new too. If you use these little boxes, you can do UV shell and just click. Um, so I'm just using, I'm using my pen. And I'm using the top toggle on the pen with nothing touched down. Um, I'm hovering the pen tip over the tablet. And then you just go to UVs, UV shell. And then you can just click on the one you want. And it should just be in here. But, you know, it doesn't give us UVs. That's okay. Function control, F12, we're okay. Oh, why does it grab the back too? Not cool, Maya. I thought you were supposed to know what you're doing. It's probably user error. <laughs> All right, select shell. Let's see. There we go. So now we have the front and the back. Um, so let's grab this guy. Unfold. Now the torsos will get a little wonky at the neck. Yeah, you see that? Oh, it, it didn't do a really nice job. Um, Sometimes actually grabbing these edges along this edge here. So I'll, I'll probably go in here and just cut that off. So let's cut this. And I'll probably unfold this as a separate shell. Maybe that'll help it. Relax, unfold. Um, if that doesn't work, that's okay. We can actually go in and move a couple of these by hand. Just grab these and move them around. And it's okay if you make a mess because that's what the relax and unfold fold tool is for. Let's see, this guy goes down here. Because what it's trying to do, it's, it's kind of just spiraling on us. Um, so sometimes relaxing it. Okay, now play nice. Look at it, it just keeps making the same mess. Don't forget, you guys can grab little sections of things too. Let's see if that helps, like relax it. Oh, that worked pretty good. Okay, so that relax it. Watch when I go to unfold it again, it'll be like, nope, gotcha. <laughs> Select shell, unfold, there. Oh, no, well, you weren't supposed to do that. Making a liar out of me, Maya. Why? I vouched for you so many years. Look at that. It's like, I look nice. Nope. So maybe just be careful with how much you do it. Um, this is where you could probably check with, <laughs> I hate UVs. I knew there was going to be someone in the class that was going to say that. <laughs> um, so this is where we can kind of, I mean, it's, it's in a good spot. We could just kind of move things over, help it out. It's confused. Maya gets confused. She's got a lot going on in her life. A little extra baggage. No worries. We can move this around. Okay. It's, it's, it's good that this happens to me so that if it happens to you guys, you'll know that, hey, it happened to, to me. I'm supposed to know what I'm doing. See, it's just 
doesn't like us. Aha! Yes! Take that thing. <laughs> now I feel like partying. All right, so now what we can do, um, now that it's decided to finally work with me and not turn me into a fool in front of my students, thank you, Maya. I guess she finally came to her senses. Uh, we'll just grab this again. Go on our UV texture editor, move and sew, which is one of these, which one? Do you guys, have you guys used move and sew? Whoops, I did it for you. Oh well, uh, it's this guy here. <laughs> okay, so move and sew with the edges selected. And now it's laid out nice and pretty and you're good to go. Okay, so let's grab that. Why are you being ridiculous? There we go. Get out of my way. Now this one is red. And because we're not laying this on top of another one, there's something we need to do. Okay, flip it. Flip it with this. What's this? Oh, that didn't work. That was a bad idea. The polygons. Maybe there's something in here. Um. Oh, hey, check this out. Flip it. Okay, so polygons. You guys are right. You know what you're doing. Flip. Okay, and then we'll, I guarantee you, watch, I'm going to say, oh, it's going to do the same thing as the other one. <laughs> I like your little table flip. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. All right, and then uh, we're going to unfold, and wow, hey, thank you, because I guaranteed that it would mess up. It didn't mess up. Thank you, Maya. You're so awesome. Such a good friend. Okay, so with the head, now I know when we look at it in the preview, okay, so what we're looking at here is the back of the head is chopped. And then there's a seam from there where we have a little junction, okay? And then this is the bottom. And then we're going to cut some flares in it so it lays out nicer. And this is actually the top of the head that's flipped up, almost like if you were to scalp somebody, that's what we're looking at. Okay, so what we're seeing is... This... And because I have mirroring on, is this grabbing everything I need? Okay, so these are the edges that are cut. Okay, so if I go into my texture editor, I'm gonna cut this, go into our UVs, let's see what it does, just to see if it's gonna work. It might make a mess. Uh, and it worked, cool. So now we just need to figure out where to put those little bottom cuts that we saw that kind of help flare and relax that neck area. So that's actually coming straight down from the top of that little junction on the top of the head, straight down, and then it's cut on both sides. Okay, so this is where it gets important to kind of learn to read that edge flow. Because um, by doing that, it makes things a little bit easier for us. So... It's this edge and this edge. Let's see. This edge straight down. That should be it. Let's cut it. Grab our shell again. Unfold and it should kind of flare it out. Ooh, yeah, that's perfect. There we go. So you just relax on that one and it'll it'll work. So there you go. That's how you lay out the head. Um, we did the arm, the leg, now the foot and the hand, and the, the rest will be up to you guys. Really, it's not too bad of a project. You saw we cranked it out in like, what, 20 minutes or so? And that's with me explaining things. So you guys should be able to bang through that one pretty quick. All right, so the uh, week three lecture activity. This week, hey, Maya, it's not your time to shine. Okay, this week you guys will be doing the continuing the secondary forms of your critter that you were sculpting and pushing into the tertiary forms. This is where you're going to start sculpting. Oh, let's say he's got little bumps, like those little warts that the guy likes to draw all the time. This is when you're going to start doing the creases under the eyes. Okay. So again, these are just 
to keep you guys practicing and just to get you guys to um, get into tertiary forms and sculpting. So don't spend all week on this and save everything else to the end. Spend maybe three hours on this at the most. Um, when you're done with this, you're going to post all those screen grabs for me into an, uh, JD, we'll check that out in one moment. I'll answer your question. That's a good question. Um, but we're going to take these images, screen grab them, post them to the lecture activities week three, and then you're good to go. Now, JD had asked, um, what is the best tool to make a crease? So I'm going to go ahead and fire up ZBrush here. Um, while I wait for that to open, which is probably going to open in the middle of me talking here, um, just some reminders for you guys. You have your lecture activity, which we just went over. You have your resurfacing project. So for your resurfacing, how many heads are you guys going to do? Two. And torsos? Two. Awesome. You guys got it. Uh, now, your UVs and textures, remember, what's going to be mirrored? What's our first step that we're going to do probably when we open our gray dude that's given to us? Cut them in half. That's right. And then we probably would do what? It doesn't come with these. Yes, create your UVs. You guys got it. So then from there, you guys know what to do because we just went over that. Your assembly of parts. This is where you're taking the ear you created last week and the head you created last week and attaching those together. And you have your topology troubleshooting quiz. Now, if something comes up in this quiz that you're not sure what it is, I'm totally fine with you guys going online and researching it. This is open book, open notes. It's just so you guys can... Tell me what you have learned, okay? And you have your week three discussion. Okay, so we're going to be looking for those. Now, everything in red is going to be submitted in the week three submission activity on FSO. Um, those are all put into one file, again, just like you guys did last week, except this week you're doing it with these assignments here, and submitted to the week three. And finally, I always say it, but take advantage of those open lab and open office hours. Um, I don't want you guys feeling frustrated or trapped or alone because you're not alone. We're here for you. Okay. Don't ever feel that way. All right. So the question that had come up um, was what's a good tool to create a crease? Uh, my file looks a little different here. I'm going to just grab a Dyna wax, Dyna mesh sphere from the, uh, light box there just for demo purposes I'll turn off the floor all right so this is a sphere that we can get from the the light box set that is already Diana mesh so if we go here we'll see it's already turned on it's got really high geometry in there so typically some tools you can use um, the let's see the Damien standard brush is really nice that's up here under D, which totally makes sense. I don't know why I was looking anywhere else. Um, so I'm going to turn this off and I'll show you what it kind of does. So that gives you like a pretty wide pinched area. Now, this isn't super high res, so it's not going to be really sharp. Okay, But what we can do after creating this is we can go in and use our pinch tool and kind of tighten it up a bit. Okay, so we can get a really nice sharp crease. Okay, so that works really nicely. Um, if Another tool that I really like to use, this isn't really necessarily for creases, but this is something else um, that I like to use because I'm a lot like you guys with keeping things neat when I sculpt. Now I know in PRM they'd probably hate me <laughs> for telling you guys this, but it's okay. You guys get to learn new stuff all the time. All right, so I'm going to make my sphere ugly. And if I smooth it, let's say that I still have some stuff that I just I can't really smooth out because there's too much geometry in place holding a lot of these lumps. Um, so if you want to smooth out your character so it looks a little more neat, we can go in here. And a tool that I really like, it's, it's been my best friend now. I can't stop using it. That's probably a bad thing. And I probably overuse it. But it's called the polish tool, which is here. So what this does is if you carefully use it, it tries to kind of get, it, it smooths out lumps in your model. Um, and this is 
again, this is one of my favorites. I work on a lot of cartoon characters. I really love sculpting stylized characters. And this is kind of helps to polish and flatten out some of those areas and get rid of the lumps. Um, another shader that you can select, um, by default you guys have that wax. Now this isn't all the way white because there we go. So this is usually what you're seeing when you're working. Um, if you don't like using this, if you click over here, one that I found and I actually found out recently that a modeler from Pixar uses this is the pearl matte cap. So that's right here. And this is almost like a blend inside of Maya. So it, it kind of helps us to see any sort of lumps and bumps that need to be cleaned up. Okay, so you guys can see it. It does a really nice job with smooth and polish. And then the shader in combination with that is really nice. Can I go over a pen? Yes, I can. Now that is back in Maya. Um, now while we're in ZBrush, are there any questions as far as ZBrush before we jump back into Maya? Now this week you, if you're using, uh, if you have any warts on your character, like really nasty gross warts, remember inflate is awesome. If we bump down the fall off on this, the append inside of ZBrush. Is that in here? What? Is, a pen for around his eyes. I'm not sure what he's talking about. I'm going to have to ask him myself. Um, but if, you, if your character has any warts, if you bump down the fall off a little bit, uh, that focal shift, see, like if we do something like that, it's kind of pulling a little too much, right? We're getting, it's not really soft, but we can always kind of smooth and tap those edges back so it, it looks really gross because that's what we want with those warts. I know some of you guys have some really cool characters with warp. Um, attaching the eyeballs, a pen. I'm trying to think what he might be talking about. Yeah, it, that works, the eyes with insert sphere. I'm not sure, but I'm, I'm trying to think about it, if there's anything in here, uh, a pen. I think, was this, were you guys looking at um, your head build? when he mentioned this? Or was he looking at your lecture activity? The lecture activity. A pen tool. Um, well, I know there are some tools like, um, like you guys just mentioned the uh, insert sphere. It was, but if he only mentioned it, hmm, it probably, I don't, let's see, if, if it was me, I would probably think it's like these insert spheres. Um, I'm really not sure what he's talking about. A pen tool. I'm going to have to ask him what he was talking about with, with you. Um, cause I know there's like, there's other tools that I really can't get into with you guys right now because you're supposed to be learning those in a different class. So I don't want to step on anybody's toes. Um, but you can use things like the insert sphere. Now, usually if you use this and then read Dynamesh. Now, it didn't really put it on there. It did kind of a crappy job. Uh, but you can use tools that you find in here. Uh, let's see, like, oh, let's say insert cube, for example. If we drag these on, uh, we can actually use the move tool here and just kind of push it in. And then if we resim it, it'll try to connect it. See what it did? It tried to... Connect it like that. So that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, the insert is very cool. Now I want to show you guys something. Let me pause my screen share and I'm going to mute myself while I pull this up. But I want to show you guys something pretty cool. Um, yeah, I think you guys will like this. It's a cool hint and tip that I'm probably not supposed to show you guys, but it's okay. Uh -huh. Okay, so give me one moment. Bonus, that's right. Okay, so I have an example here that I actually grabbed um, from a student. Okay, do you guys remember this guy? 
when you, you did this primitive breakdown. Oops, hold on. There we go. Now you'll be able to see it. You remember doing this in week one? You're probably sitting there going, why are, they, why are they having us do this? This is so weird. Okay, watch this. All right, so this is something I do that is pretty nice. Um, <laughs> this is not the end-all be-all way to do things, of course, but if you're really good at primitive breakdowns, this is kind of fun. So I'm just going to combine these. Okay, and delete history, rid of all that garbage. So I have just one combined dude here, right? I'm going to export this as an OBJ to my desktop, and that's a really sloppy way to do it, but oh well. All right, so we're going to call this test one. So export that. Now I'm going to jump into ZBrush. Give me a new document. Now, you guys might notice that my document looks a little different than yours. Um, that's only because I went into my document here, and there's, um, there's a background gradient. Usually, you guys are probably used to, well, the black on top. But if you, if you turn that down to zero, you just get a flat gray. So that might help you guys. Um, that's just another hint and tip. All right, so I'm going to import that test object, draw them into my scene. All right, so that's all fine and dandy, but now what? So I'm going to actually, I don't know how this is DynaMesh already. All right, so I'm going to turn this guy into DynaMesh, if it'll let me. This is probably going to crash. Okay, so now that he's DynaMeshed, Oops, no, don't put a sphere in there. Or a cube, that's a cube. <laughs> um, but what I can do is I could just, he's already combined. I could just smooth this out. Now, I probably would have used something else for the hands and feet because spheres are, or cubes are a little bit difficult to smooth out. But this is a really quick way just to get base volume and form. All I'm doing is this smoothing. There's, this is probably really super dense. I probably should have bumped down the resolution a bit. Let's see. It's a little better. Um, but now I can, there we go. Now I'm getting some movement. But this is a way, now the arms weren't really done too well inside of Maya. Uh, but this is a way that you can probably get a really quick, form. I mean, that looks pretty good, right? I mean, <laughs> for how quick, for if you're sitting there doing just builds like that, like we could have even done that with the little critters that you guys are doing for your lecture activity. If you just did, if we look at your, your breakdowns on concept share. Okay. Oh, let me turn this off for a minute. There we go. So let's go in here, check out your lecture activities. Okay, so if we're looking at these, and if we actually built these inside of Maya, and made sure make sure everything is intersecting, just like we had with the one that I just showed you. Um, but if we built these inside of Maya, we've we can lock down our proportions and everything, and our volumes really quickly. Dynamesh it, smooth it out, and then just jump right into just finalizing those secondary forms and then tertiary forms. That's how I like the model really quickly. And I kind of, I kind of held that from you guys because I wanted you guys to learn the other ways before I taught you the cheaty ways. So now that you know the harder way and you'll see another way and maybe it'll kind of open your eyes to different ways to approach things. Um, so now the primitive breakdown, when you guys are doing that, how, you know, you're going, how, what does this have to do with anything? Now you can kind of see, oh, it's usable. How cool is that? You can use DynaMesh and crank out a, 
model pretty quickly. I mean, of course, we're going to end up with a little bit of touch up, but it's a lot quicker than fighting the tools, right? And again, you guys, you guys know my history. I like, I like clean modeling over uh, <laughs> being super crazy with my edge flow, but there we go. So there we go. Clean that up. Inflate that a bit. So do you guys think you would ever try using something like that now that you know about it? And wow, I really move that around. Heck yeah. <laughs> All right. So now when you guys are looking at objects and forms, remember Prim's breakdown is your super awesome shortcut to getting shapes really quickly. Yay, teachers. All right. <laughs> um, jumping back to the keynote here. Are there any questions, Andrew? I thought we could have uh, thought about it. Yeah. Now, if you guys did that with your lecture activity, that would have been okay. Um, I really just want you guys to play and build on your own with that. But um, with the with the other simple builds, we wanted to get you guys to do it how you're supposed to. So now you get yay. All right. So have a good night, guys. Um, enjoy. And I hope to see you all next week. Thank you all for coming out.